Libra at T Bookshop. Um, please browse at your leisure, wherever. Listen. Shut up. You people. No, no, not like that. I mean, you people. Customers. You come in here. So noisy. Always so noisy, entitled, with your concept of free market economy and commerce, you want to come in here and exchange your wealth for books. No, no. shh, it's not, I know, it's not a library, it's a bookshop, that's what we do, we, we shop books. Appreciate it if you kept the volume down just a little, you know, whisper with me if that's all right. You see, I have a condition, yeah, a condition the waking illness, the lucid. You caught me. You caught me. I 
vanilla handed. It's a rum and coke. A Cuba Libre. That's a pun too. Cuba means <coughs> Cuba and Libre means book. Well, anyway, like they say, the hair of the dog that bit you and then mugged you and stole your phone and then used complicated information technology to backtrace your IP address to find your exact home location and then after howling and barking the moon all night awaits you every morning on your porch to bite you again and again and again the hair of the dog that bit you and all that other stuff as well cheers um, so detective what do you want I knew it as soon as you came in with that look on your face you might as well be wearing spectacles I knew you would ask for that Perhaps I've been a clerk for too long and worked amongst books too much longer, this makes sense. But I knew when you came into this shop that you were looking for a book. Maybe I'm a detective too. Well, I know it's customary for the ask the customer if it's alright for them to smoke but I simply don't care Continuing <coughs> in the vain hope of sweet release. So, if you tell me what kind of book you're looking for, perhaps I can help rather than you rummaging around in the dark. I 
see. <clears throat> a book to help you sleep, is it? That's easy. Just read anything written after, I'd say, 1950. <laughs> serious suggestion. Well, how about one of these? Steve Jackson and Ian Livingston. No. Well, actually, you know what? That was a stupid suggestion from me. Anyway, you're smarter than that, I can see. You've seen through multiple of my ruses already. I'll tell you, the reason the Steve Jackson thing wouldn't be a good book, because they're too good. You wouldn't want to put it down. And if you can't put down a book, how are you going to sleep? Where are you going to put your hands? You know? Seriously, people say that, yeah, a good book is a good way to sleep. That is baloney. Do you know why? Because why would you want to stop reading a good book? There's some logic to the argument that, you know, trying not to sleep is the best way to fall asleep, but I don't believe that either. I don't buy it. No. A good book is the worst thing for bed. Not only will you likely get frustrated if you get to a good bit and you start getting sleepy but imagine if you fall asleep and lose your place well what if you don't find it again worse still if you're engrossed in a good book and all of a sudden you fall asleep that good book might fall on your good face and make it not so good anymore you could get a, a concussion or something never wake up book wouldn't be so good then, would it? Bad book. No. My recommendation to you, and to anyone, if you want to fall asleep, read a book you hate. Yeah. Yeah, something like that. Or a book so boring that you wish you were asleep. And the best thing is, if you fall asleep reading a book you don't care about, it doesn't matter if you lose your place. And the torturous thing will be to have to read it again. It's like a kind of literary masochism. <sighs> yeah, a sort of prosaic punishment. Well, I know. It sounds like self-flagellation or something, but yeah. A good book is hard to find anyway. about that one. That book right there. <laughs> 1921, second edition, Das Kapital. of capitalist production translated from the third German edition by Samuel Moore and Edward Aveling, edited by Frederick Engels. You yawning yet? No. Try this on for size. Book one. Commodities and money. 
and magnitude of value. The wealth of those societies in which the capitalist mode of production prevails presents itself as an immense accumulation of commodities, its unique being a single commodity. I can't even read it properly. Listen to this. Let the necessary labour time amount to 10 hours, the value of a day's labour power to 5 shillings, the surplus labour time to 2 hours, and the daily surplus value to 1 shilling. But the capitalist now produces 24 articles, which he sells at 10 pence apiece, making 20 shillings in all. Since the value of the means of production is 12 shillings, 14 two fifths of these articles merely replace the constant capital advanced. The labour of the 12 hours working day is represented by the remaining 9 and 3 fifths articles. Since the price of the labour of power is five shillings, six articles represent the necessary labour time, and three and three-fifths articles in the surplus labour. The ratio of the necessary labour to the surplus labour, which under average social conditions was five to one, is now only five to three. The same result may be arrived the following way. It goes on like this. I judge a book by the title, author, cover, or content, my friend. It is, of course, Milton's poetic works. John Milton, who wrote Paradise Lost, and then Paradise Found, the sequel. This particular one is a 1924 edition. Shakespeare, the Bane, the 
of the GCSE English student in the UK. People call it Old English, but it's not. It's early modern English, of course. Did he even write it? Who knows? Well, he did.
pictures. so bad so give it a try if you like